Hi everyone, I have a couple of notes on the video before we start. Uh, number one, I'm trying to skirt around the edges of the ways in which we talk about sexuality today because it's not really, uh, doesn't really exist in the same form during the era that it's discussed in this video. And it's about Europe, so it's necessarily Eurocentric. And number two, I'm talking about what today is Germany, and I don't speak any German, so please forgive my pronunciation. A lot of the time when we hear about LGBT history, it's really only about the last 50 years or so, as though queer history begins with Stonewall and not a moment sooner. But there's a century before that when people are thinking and talking and agitating about gay rights as such, and even centuries before that when LGBT people are carving out spaces for themselves in the world. Now these aren't exactly the same spaces that we have today, and I'm not going to touch on that. I'm going to exclude a lot of stuff here and talk about really the birth of what we today call homosexuality, um, which is not a word that comes naturally, but is was coined in Germany in the 1800s. More on that in a moment. Rather than the entire collective experience of what came before, or even what much of what comes after. So think of this video as a, a snippet of history. This is just one point in time out of many. To set it up a bit, uh, the 19th century is a time of significant change in Europe when populations are exploding in cities, and when social and cultural mores are being challenged in some really serious ways. And I'm not just talking about sex here, this is a time when we see precursors to social and political structures that we have today. Then as happens now, queer people are moving into cities, they're reinventing themselves, and they want to be surrounded by a community of like-minded peers. It's when we start to see gathering places for men who love men, like what are called molly, molly houses in Britain, or various uh, gathering places in, in Germany at the same time. It's, it's in this atmosphere that people are starting to agitate against laws <clears throat> criminalizing certain sexual acts and, and attitudes that treat same-sex love as something which to be ashamed. To give you an example, up until 1860 in Britain, sodomy is criminalized as a capital offense, meaning you can be executed for getting caught having sex. Karl Ulrichs, a lawyer and author in Prussia, which is now in Germany, is an early proponent of gay rights starting around 1860 or so. He's campaigning against the proposed law criminalizing sodomy in the empire, paragraph 175 of the Imperial Criminal Code of Prussia, which comes into play much later on. He writes a series of anonymous booklets about male sexuality where he posits a, a third sex that he calls earnings who have the bodies of men and the minds of women, and therefore choose to have sex with other men. Ulrichs posits that this condition is innate, and earning and are undeserving of being criminals because it's part of their nature. Now, Ulrichs' theory of earning and doesn't exactly take off, but he and fellow author and activist Carl Maria Kirtmany share correspondence about social and legal restrictions on sexuality in Prussia. What's significant is that they and others are referring to different sexualities as fixed and distinct, which isn't something you see in discussions about sexuality before this period. In a letter to Ulrichs in uh, 1868, Kirpany uses the word homosexuality, that homosexuality for the very first time, which he later goes on to write about in a pamphlet the following year. It's a kind of hybrid word, from the Greek homo meaning same and the Latin sexus meaning, well, sex. Kirpany's word homosexuality our homosexual goes on to be the most popular of a number of terms at this time in the new science of sexual sexology, which is literally the study of sex. Homosexual is the first kind of value-neutral term that appears in mainstream discussions of sexuality, and it signals a flowering of interest in marginal sexual and gender identities. Now, that's not to say that there wasn't a concept for same-sex relationships before the word was invented. That's why there are anti-sodomy laws on the books long before the 1800s. But it coincides with the growth of urban communities formed around sexual identity in Europe. Uh, scientific work at this time isn't censored, and, and the knowledge of homosexuality makes its way into the lives of ordinary people through the growth of scientific journals. Now, Ulrichs and Kirpany are just two of many gay rights activists working in and around Germany, and collectively they do manage to shift the discourse on same-sex love, somewhat. Even so, this is a time when gay men and women live in a liminal area of society, and while the two are never punished directly by the government for their work, I mean, Ulrichs even wins a censorship case, censorship case brought against his earning pamphlets. They're still exiled to the margins. By the end of the century, you see scientists like Magnus Hirschfeld and Havelock Ellis arguing for the normalization of homosexuality. 
In the longer term, there's a short flowering of queer life in Germany, especially during the Weimar period, just after World War I. Ultimately, though, the anti-sodomy law that the two activists are fighting against is notorious for its use during the World War II by the Third Reich. It results in a lot of people getting sent to concentration camps and ultimately dying for being gay during World War II. More on all this later. There's definitely points in this video that we want to go into more detail on, so stay tuned. Uh, in the meantime, let us know what you think in the comments. You can follow me on Twitter, you can follow the show on Tumblr, and don't forget to subscribe using the handy button. Uh, we list some resources in the description, and uh, there's a link to the transcript there as well. See you next time.